Once again to the month of October. Like we do every year on the JMC Reviews, we're going to start this month by digging into a Universal Monster Classic. Today's review is for The Mummy from 1932 with Boris Karloff. You'll feel the awful, creeping, crawling terror that stands your hair on end. One year after Karloff became a 1930s superstar with Frankenstein, The Mummy also brought back regular Universal monster producer Carl Lemail Jr. And the directing duties this time went to Carl Frund, who the year before had also been the cinematographer for Dracula with Bela Lugosi. And a few years before that, he was the cinematographer for Metropolis. This was Froon's first film as a director, and teaming up with screenwriter John L. Balderston, who would later go on to write Bride of Frankenstein, The Mummy is a reasonably well-made 1930s horror film. The story is well-structured, the direction of the actors is very good, the set design looks incredible, and the music is not half bad, composed by James Dietrich. Cinematography duties went to Charles Dumar, who had previously done the 1923 silent film The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and afterwards in 1935 would do both Werewolf of London and The Raven with Karloff and Lugosi. The editing is done by Milton Carruth, and I would say this is one of the weaker parts of The Mummy, particularly with the transitioning between scenes and locations. It just feels a bit awkward and doesn't flow particularly well. The story for The Mummy is one that's very well known to horror fans, and while it's become very cliched today as far as mummy films go... Uh, the mummy sprang from his uneasy sleep to rage vengeance on whoever dared be foolish enough to disturb the holy crypt, uh, blah blah blah, but you get the gist of it. This is one of the originals, so we can cut it a little slack. Sure. Why not? A group of archaeologists, Dr. Moore, played by returning from Dracula, Edward Van Sloan, Professor Joseph Wemple, played by Arthur Byro, and Ralph Norton, played by Bramwell Fletcher, dig up an ancient mummy who they identify as Imhotep. Death. Eternal punishment. For anyone who opens this casket. Well, let's see what's inside. Wait! Along with an ancient scroll known as the Scroll of Throth, which Dr. Muller says can raise the dead. And I believe that you have in your hut the Scroll of Thoth itself, which contains the great spell by which Isis raised Osiris from the dead. And as Muller tries to convince Professor Wemple not to look further into the scroll, Norin opens the box they found it in, deciphers the ancient text, and awakens Imhotep. The sequence of Imhotep awakening is really well done, very quiet, very subtle, and the makeup work on Boris Karloff is 
fucking amazing. This is some of Jack P. Pierce's best work of all the universal monsters he made up, and apparently it took him eight goddamn hours to put Karloff into that makeup. Karloff commented, You did a great job, but you forgot to give me a fly. Imhotep walks over, takes the scroll. Norin, seeing Imhotep, is so shocked that he loses his mind. <laughs> After Moa leaves, too afraid of a curse being brought down upon them, Wemple returns, finds Norin laughing like an idiot. <laughs> he went for a little walk. You should have seen his face. <laughs> This opening scene I'm a little mixed on. Yes, Imhotep coming alive is eerily chilling, very well done, but the over-the-top laughter of the Norton character kind of hurts the flow of the scene, and I get he's insane now, but it just comes off as really unintentionally, uh, silly. <laughs> We cut to nine years later, when we see another expedition going down in Egypt, this time run by Professor Wemple's son, Frank Wemple, played by another actor returning from Dracula, David Manners, and his colleague Professor Pearson, played by Leonard Moody. Back we go to London, and what fools we look. Hole after hole dug in this blasted desert. While well, talking about how this expedition has been a big failure and they are the only ones left, they are suddenly greeted by a mysterious stranger. Your expedition has not been a success. <laughs> Scarcely. Who is, and this is no real big shock, Imhotep, after apparently going to the mall and getting his bandages removed, comes in with a broken piece of pottery that he says will lead to the tomb of the Princess Anak Sunaman. Just before they're about to go, they ask who he is, and he gives the fake name... Ardeth Bay. Which in the 1999 remake would be the name given to the head Magi character. I guess they thought the name was too good not to use again, if not on the main villain. Imhotep shows them the tomb, talks about how Egyptians are forbidden from digging up their own dead, and they quickly discover the tomb of Anak Sunaman. The seal of the seven jackals. And it's unbroken. The successful dig brings Frank's father back to Egypt, and while the archaeologists from the British Museum found it, the findings go to the Cairo Museum. And while this is going on, we see a local half-Egyptian woman, Helen Grosvenor, played by Zita Joan, sitting at a party looking over the pyramids of Egypt, while talking with Dr. Moore, who apparently is still around. Is there a view like this in all the world, Helen? The real Egypt. Frank spots Helen and is immediately taken in by her beauty. At the Cairo Museum, we see Imhotep slash Ardith Bay looking over the mummified corpse of Anak Sunaman. Professor Wemple appears, saying it's closing time, but upon finding out that it's Ardith Bay he's talking to, he asks him to stay. Why, we have you to thank that we have this exhibit here at all. The museum should be kept open all night in your honor. After an awkward exchange with both Frank and his father, Imhotep leaves. You must come to my house. I regret I am too occupied to accept invitation. A little while later, Imhotep breaks into the museum, sets up the scroll Throth next to Anaxanaman's sarcophagus, and starts chanting, drawing Helen into a trance and making her slowly head to the museum. Upon arriving at the museum, Helen is spotted by Frank and his father, and while she's under Inhotep's influence, she is apparently not that strong. She keeps banging at the museum door, trying to get in. I must get in. I must get in. Alone beneath the ship. Let me in, let me in. She faints. So, Frank and his father take her to their place. Back inside the museum, a guard spots Imhotep, and he quickly flees, but not before killing the guard with shock, as it's later described. 
So he died of shock. But also leaving the scroll behind. Upon waking up, Helen is obviously surprised by finding herself in an unfamiliar setting. How did I get here? We brought you here. Father and I. You fainted. <laughs> yeah, her eyes say it all. Well, there's still a 1% chance that bartender roofied me. The scene where Helen and Frank talk after she wakes up is very cringy in how immediately in love they are. The dialogue here is not really well written, and that's something that I feel the film suffers from a little. While the story structure is very good, the writing for some of the dialogue is not the greatest. What girl could fail to make a conquest or collapse to demand feet in the moonlight? Oh, I know it seems absurd when we've known each other such a short time. But the cringy TV melodrama level dialogue is slightly more bearable than usual due to the actual pretty good chemistry between Zita Joan and David Manners. But I've never been serious about this sort of thing before. <laughs> you can tell me to go to the devil, but you can't laugh at me. Even though it's pretty bad and schmaltzy, they do work off each other pretty well, and if it was only for the fact that they hadn't just met each other, maybe this could have worked a little better. I mean, at least in Dracula, it was established that Jonathan Harker and Nina had been together for quite some time. When we got the wrappings off, and I saw her face, you will think me silly, and I sort of fell in love with her. That's fucking crazy, man. Dr. Moore shows up, asks Helen what happened, gets an idea of what is going on, and then Professor Wemple gets a call from the museum about the death of the guard. They find the scroll of Throth, and the two of them realize what is happening. Upon returning home, they see the very rushed romance blooming between Helen and Frank. The curse has struck her. It will strike my son. Seriously, you assholes just met each other. Moeller, Professor Wemple, and Frank go into the study where they talk about the scroll, and Frank, while struggling to believe like Jonathan Harker, is a little easier to buy into everything than he was in Dracula. Imhotep arrives, and he is greeted at the door by Professor Wemple's servant, who is billed in the credits only as the Nubian, played by Noble Johnson, an actor who built a career as being one of the most successful black actors of his time and one of the first black film producers. He was president of the Lincoln Motion Picture Company, a company that throughout the 19-teens was devoted to making films that portrayed African Americans in more human roles. Not sure if this role would be considered one of his personal favorites. He's a black servant who quickly is made a slave due to Imhotep's power. Although, for what it counts, Dr. Muller is disgusted by this and says that if he could break Imhotep's flesh, he would. And in the sequence between Imhotep and the other main players, Boris Karlov and Zita Joan, who I said had good chemistry with David Manners, they actually show equally good, intense chemistry together. But you are of our blood. As to that, I am not mistaken. My mother was Egyptian. But we must see each other again. I shall be honored. Imhotep sees Helen as the reincarnation of Princess Anak Sunaman, who we find out was actually Imhotep's lover, but because he was a priest and she was a Vestal Virgin, they couldn't be together. And through a extremely well done flashback sequence that still is pretty chilling to watch after all these years, we see that after Anak Sunaman died, Imhotep stole the scroll of Throth to try to resurrect her. I dared the god's anger. He was caught and was condemned by the pharaoh to be buried alive. And the sequence of Karloff being wrapped up alive, looking completely terrified, is extremely well done. You feel the fear in him, and even though he's the villain, you do feel a little sympathy for him in these particular moments where he talks about his love for Anak Sunaman and everything he's gone through to be with her. 
I'm in love. Under Muller's insistence, Professor Wemple tries to burn the scroll of Throth, but Imhotep, using another evil chant, causes Professor Wemple to have a heart attack. And the Nubian servant, now completely under Imhotep's control, steals the scroll and burn some newspapers to try and throw Muller and Frank off. At first it seems like they're convinced, but Muller, who's very smart, figures out it was newspaper. Wear this around your neck. The Egyptians believed was a charm against evil sendings. And Frank, following his heart and probably his dick, agrees to keep Helen safe. And I can't hold this off anymore. The similarities between Dracula and The Mummy are fucking ridiculous. Both movies have an undead antagonist trying to capture or seduce a beautiful young woman, a boyfriend who's head over heels in love with her, and a doctor who, next to his day job, is an expert on monsters and knows how to defeat them. And both of those two characters are played by the same fucking actors. We also get multiple scenes of the main character staring evilly into the camera. Although Karloff's is more chilling in a creepy sense, while well, Lugosi's was chilling in a seductive sense. I'm not saying these similarities make The Mummy a bad film, it's just, it's crazy how much they copy the storyline and flow and... I guess you can't fault a studio and producer for ripping off their own movie. It's possible. And after the upteenth copy and paste scene, Muller comes in and tells Frank that Imhotep has beat him, that they couldn't uh, lure him to Helen or something. We tried to find him and failed. The way this dialogue is worded, talking about how their plan failed, you kind of feel like you've missed a few scenes. And that's probably true because in the film's cast list, we see a credit for Henry Victor as the Saxon warrior, even though there is no character that goes under that title in any scene in the film. Sir, not appearing in this film. Apparently the Saxon warrior was a character featured in a lengthy flashback sequence that was completely cut from the film that featured Anak Tsunamin's multiple reincarnations over the past 3,000 years. And why'd they keep the credit? Who knows, maybe they just wanted to fuck with them at the premiere. They betrayed me, they didn't keep their promise, they tricked me and I don't care anymore. Frank, in an unbelievably retarded moment, takes a charm that Moore said would protect him from Imhotep's magic and puts it on Helen's doorknob to try and protect her. And what happens not a minute after he takes the charm off? Neptunia. He gets the charm just as he passes out, and then Helen leaves, making her way to the museum. And I think I should mention, this was a pre-code Hollywood era film, meaning that the film was able to get away with a few things that, while not extreme, were definitely racy for the time. Don't you think I've had enough excitement for one evening without the additional thrill of a strange man making love to me? Such as characters using the words hell and damn, some violent sequences, and last but not least, Helen slash Anaxunamans get up in the big finale because DAMN! What can I say? Not pornographic, but definitely made a few men and probably some women's head spin in the 1930s. And it's here that Helen is now fully taken over by Anaxunamans' personality. And with the way she talks, acts, and looks. You can kind of see why Imhotep would go through all this trouble to try and bring her back from the dead. And now that the gods have forgiven us. No, no, not yet. Anaxunamen is at first very happy to see Imhotep, but upon finding out that he plans to turn her into a mummy, saying that he could just resurrect her 3,000 plus corpse, but he doesn't want a lifeless body that will just follow his command. He wants her spirit to be with him as well. Kind of nice, I guess. But she's not down for getting killed and 
turn into a mummy queen, so she tries to fight back. Almost out of nowhere to the point that you sort of feel a bit of whiplash from the 180 the mood of the film is taken. Moeller finds Frank still unconscious, and they quickly make their way to the museum. And as Imhotep is about to kill a Noxunaman, Frank and Moeller arrive, distracting him long enough, and the Noxunaman goes to the statue of Isis, begging for her help, and... This is kind of where the film falls apart for me. The mummy has been pretty well made and despite feeling like a few scenes were cut, well paced. But this ending, god is it a letdown. Anaxunaman prays to the statue of Isis. The statue slowly moves its arm, pointing at Imhotep. We get a flashing blinding light that Frank and Moeller quickly cover their eyes from. Don't look at it! Keep your eyes shut! And then Imhotep, with the most bored-looking expression you will ever see, slowly decays in a effect that hasn't aged well. Frank goes to Helen, holds her, Moeller says their love, which, by the way, is still only a few fucking days old, is strong enough that it could bring her back to her normal self. And then we cut to the burning scroll and a plastic skeleton on the floor that's supposed to be Imhotep, and the film just ends. A few years ago on my now defunct review show, The Mini Reviews, I covered The Mummy from 1932 and I talked about how it was my least favorite of the Universal Monster Classics. And by no means is The Mummy from 1932 a bad film, I just find it to be the least memorable. While there is some really good chemistry between Zita Jean and David Manners and Boris Karloff, the film lacks the overall seductive charm of Dracula with Bela Lugosi. The horror element of the film is really well done in certain parts and reasonably chilling if not 100% scary. The look, design, and acting from Boris Karloff as the mummy is the best part of the film. After doing Frankenstein where he had no dialogue, this movie allowed Karloff to show a bit more range, going from a soft-spoken, cold figure to an overly emotional man in love who is willing to kill anyone who gets in his way. The worst parts are once again the out-of-nowhere romance that just happens at the drop of a pin between Helen and Frank. Oh, Helen, it's been such torture. I love you so. The chanting slash spell scenes with Imhotep. With the exception of Professor Wemple's death, I just did not find any of these chanting scenes chilling. For the most part, they just felt like a collection of scenes with an angsty man on his knees mumbling. And of course, the opening and ending sequences felt very small compared to the rest of the film. And yes, the ending of Dracula was also a little bit of a letdown, but that film kept itself at a pretty soft, calm level. The Mummy amped things up with its intense style, acting, and particularly music. That the final sequence of Imhotep being defeated, which I get it, it's the 1930s, it's not like they could do a big action sequence, but it's just a statue pointing its hand at the main villain, and he's defeated. Ah, fuck it, dude. Let's go bold. It is a well-made film, it just doesn't leave the same impact as Dracula, Frankenstein, and The Invisible Man did. In fact, the 1999 remake left a bigger impact. And this is one of the cases where I'm not ashamed to say I actually enjoy the over-the-top CGI blockbuster remake more than the original. As for the 2017 remake, I didn't see it, so I have no opinion to give. Do I recommend The Mummy from 1932? Yes. This film does have a lot to admire in terms of makeup and performance, and I guess the fact I would go out on would be Zita Johan and Carl Frun, the director, did not get along during filming. 
for reasons that I don't think really anyone can figure out. Froon apparently didn't like her from the get-go. According to Johan, he apparently told her that she'd have to be naked for a scene, and even though this was the pre-code era, they wouldn't have been able to get away with that. She thinks that he was expecting her to protest, but instead she, I think in an almost sarcastic way, went, well, if you can get it past the censors. Also, Froon apparently put her in an arena of lions for a scene that ultimately got cut. Despite the miserable experience she had working on The Mummy, Zita Johan said she loved working with Boris Karloff. And, fun fact, when she first saw him in The Mummy makeup after a grueling day of filming, she apparently passed out. <laughs> Zita Johan, she's beautiful, gave a pretty great performance. David Manners more or less played the same character he played in Dracula. Nothing terrible, but nothing special, just passable. Edward Van Sloan, even though it's pretty much just Van Helsen hunting a mummy, he is still the second best actor in this film, and you can never get too much Van Sloan. See you next week, where we actually review a film that's a follow-up to a movie we covered last October. Maybe he got too gay with the Vestal Virgins in the temple. Possibly.